We are experimenting today with the use of Portuguese subtitles. Um, so I will keep an eye on your faces to see how much you're laughing at the quality of the translation that's coming through because it's obviously all automated based on my voice. Um, but I hope at least uh, for those of you for whom English is not a first language, which I understand is most of you, uh, I hope that the Portuguese subtitles will uh, help somewhat. So let's move on. Today is the, the introductory session um, for this uh, I said uh, course on leadership in online learning. I hope you'll find it interesting. Uh, today we're going to kick off uh, with an introduction from Wisdom, uh, with whom we liaised in setting up the course. We will just very briefly outline the reason for, for the course. Uh, after that, my colleague Andrew Moore, who you can see on the screen, is going to give you a brief overview of the, the course as a whole um, and introduce the various facilitators who are going to be working with you on this process. And then I will take you through a presentation on the role of institutional leadership in online learning. Uh, and we'll have some brief group activity and then wrap up the session for the day. Um, we're expecting that this session should not last more than 90 minutes. Um, we have started slightly late, but we'll try and catch up the time so that we are finished by 10.30 a.m. Um, so in the interest of, of catching up that time, let me hand straight over to Wisdom to just provide a brief introduction from the ICED side, and then we'll get going. Thank you, Wisdom. Uh, yeah. The, the main objective of this course is to create a leadership capacity in online uh, education uh, among uh, the ESED uh, senior staff, especially the new staff who joined us in February. The other objective uh, of this course is for us to uh, get online skills, uh, how to maneuver around uh, the systems which we use within our organization. And also, we, we, we hope to, to achieve uh, a team spirit, and uh, we hope that uh, this process will also be a, a team building uh, a process so that we, we can become uh, one team. And uh, also, uh, as Neil has said, we would also want to identify our future needs uh, in terms of capacity building and see where we would need uh, more training, where we would need more capacitation. So basically, this is what we want to achieve uh, in this course. So I hand over to you, Neil. Thank you very much for that introduction, Wisdom. Um, it is... Uh, I'm sorry in a way that we can't have a first session as a face-to-face -face workshop up at your uh, institution. Unfortunately, um, international travel borders are still closed at the moment from South Africa. Um, but hopefully, uh, as we've all become familiar with the use of online technologies, uh, it will still be an effective process. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Andrew, who is just going to first introduce the course facilitators. Uh, and then take you through a brief overview of what you can expect in the course over the next uh, several weeks. Cool. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yes, so th these are the, the usual suspects, I'm afraid. Um, you know many of us from previous uh, engagements with ISCED. Uh, Neil, of course, is uh, the today's facilitator and also uh, coordinates and directs uh, MBA. Um, he's going to be looking after uh, today's session and we'll see him again later on in the in the program. Uh, he will come back and talk about um, uh, budgeting and finance and uh, various other issues. Um, then you also see on the screen at the moment there's Ephraim. Ephraim you should know from your quality assurance. He's uh, done quite a lot of work at uh, ISCED in the past. He is going to join us next week where we're going to talk about aspects of design and quality assurance. And so we're going to try to ensure that 
uh, we leverage his expertise and your experience so that the message we put across is contextually relevant. So Ephraim's going to join us uh, next week. And then I'm in the middle there. Um, I'm going to be uh, running a number of sessions. Uh, we will go through in a moment another slide which will show you what the sessions are. But uh, you're going to get a lot, of, a lot from me, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, uh, grin and bear it. Um, the, here's our course overview. And um, today's we, is basically an introduction. Why is it important that the leadership of an institution like the ISCED um, is aware of the latest trends in terms of technology mediated learning? And um, uh, we're going to follow that up by delving deeper in the next sessions. So time to design is our second one. We're going to meet next Friday for that one. And we're going to look at uh, the importance of uh, clever and insightful program and course design. And obviously we're going to touch on quality assurance as well to make sure that it reflects the design and the, the materials uh, reflect well on the institution. Um, Number three uh, will be on the following Wednesday. We are going to be looking at open educational resources. The exciting thing about these items, these openly licensed resources, is that they are very cost effective for an institution who is developing materials, online materials. So what are these things? Why are they useful? And is there sufficient of these openly licensed materials for the types of courses that you run? Um, you will see also that um, just putting your materials up online is not good uh, online education. Uh, quite often, our learners need to have um, a facilitated experience. In many ways, online learning is harder than face-to-face, -face, and therefore, an online facilitator is important. So what are the strategies? What are the techniques to ensure that you're doing that? I was very fortunate to be at ISED a few years ago to see the first batch of facilitators come through. So I'm hoping we're going to have a good discussion on what makes good facilitation. Number five, uh, we're going to look at assessment. Uh, in this post-COVID-19 uh, world, how can we do more of our assessment online and make sure that it is authentic, that what we are measuring in our assessment is meaningful? And uh, so we'll look at that in week five, six, an overview of the tools, systems, and platforms. So we're going to get a little bit techy in six. We're going to be looking at different learner management systems, student management systems. We're going to be looking at different authoring packages and what's available uh, and so on. As managers, yes, perhaps you won't be the person who... Um, has to maintain and look after these systems, but you un need to understand their potential and what, uh, what benefits you could derive from them. So uh, in terms of strategic planning and so on. So we'll look at those. Managing and budgeting models for ICT institutional infrastructure and software. Um, and that will be in week seven. And then we need to sit down and we need to pull it all together and say, so what does this mean for this institution? So we're going to uh, have a very different approach in week eight. It's going to be very much a collaborative experience and we want you to get, uh, uh, give us your insights. We're going to try and chart your professional development needs and also the requirements uh, for the wider ISED uh, staff and personnel. <clears throat> so how are we going to do this? So our delivery approach is we're going to meet once a week uh, and we're going to do what I've now heard is called bicronus. Bicronus? It's a mixture of asynchronous and synchronous online meetings. So what we're doing now at the moment, we're having a Zoom session. That's an example of a synchronous uh, learning environment. And then we're going to be using Moodle as well. Uh, a lot of your courses are deployed using Moodle. So we're going to use asynchronous learning strategies as well. We're going to mix the two together and try and model what it might, uh, what a good uh, uh, environment might look like online. So we're going to have eight synchronous sessions. And then each week, we're going to provide you with some independent study. So uh, uh, your synchronous systems, uh, the synchronous sessions won't all be yada, 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 yada. We're going to off, uh, ask you to do things during your Zoom sessions. But then we're going to ask you to do uh, work independently on the Moodle system in between each week. We calculate that there is around 24 hours of independent study. There is six hours of asynchronous interaction. 
So those are going to be things like forums and other opportunities to engage with a group uh, uh, during the week. And there is also uh, eight hours of uh, 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 online activities. So we want you to do stuff. We want you to not just listen and be a passive learner. We want you to be active learners. We want you to be engaged with the materials and the issues that we raise. And we want you to uh, give us your insights. So yes, that is our course overview and how we hope to deliver it. At the end of the session today, I'll take you through the Moodle environment where all your goodies are waiting for you. And uh, I'll explain how those work then. All right. I think it's enough from me for now. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, Milka has just uh, informed us that uh, the general director of ICED, Prof. Isidra, is now connected. So, Prof, um, I'm going to hand over to you to uh, give us a few words of introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, Today I am here in Shimoyo, that's why I am connected directly from the Russell Center in Shimoyo, Manika Shimoyo. Uh, we connect or we are able to connect after seven minutes <laughs> later to the time. But uh, I think you will is the main object. What I hope for this course is everybody could understand the, work, the, the, the course and uh, that everybody should also uh, make sure that participate in all sessions and could deliver a good job means for us it's very important as managers for ISET really to take in account that many of these uh, course outlines uh, uh, will be delivered but uh, we need really to, uh, to take our time and uh, understand all the things. Uh, because uh, I hope that all the, uh, our, uh, what I can say, uh, our facilitators will be able also to help us in all tasks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof, for that word of intro uh, those words of introduction. Um, uh, it's great to have you here, and uh, thank you for the encouragement. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to get straight into the presentation now. Um, I have, we, we do now have 30 participants, so I think we're close to a full house. And um, as I've said in the chat, please do keep your microphones muted uh, unless you are specifically talking. Um, you're also very welcome to answer question or ask questions in the chat. Andrew will be monitoring the chat and providing some responses. Um, and I have also activated the subtitling translation into Portuguese in PowerPoint. So you can all have a good laugh at uh, the quality of the translation into Portuguese as I talk, but I hope it will help a little bit um, for those of you who are uh, struggling to follow the English, but, but I will also try and make sure that I'm speaking slowly. Um, so, What I'm going to do today is just provide a little bit of a conceptual introduction to the course as a whole, uh, and then talk about some issues that I think are particularly important uh, with respect to online learning, um, particularly as it pertains to ICED, of course, but also slightly more generally as well. 
I am very fortunate because uh, I get the opportunity to work in developing countries all around the world, um, from Indonesia and India, right across the African continent, back to my home here in South Africa. Um, and I think that it's, we're running this course at, at an interesting time because of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic and because of the effect that it's had, not only on education, but on societies more generally. So leaving aside the obvious health consequences, I think one of the most important developments that we're seeing as a result of the coronavirus pandemic is that the, uh, the, the digital economy has really been accelerated uh, at a pace that we hadn't even anticipated uh, six or seven months ago. So as the CEO of PayPal observed, he estimates that the digital economy has been brought forward at least three to five years by coronavirus. So this is excellent news for ICED because it means that people are willing to embrace online learning uh, in ways that, wasn't, that weren't possible even six or seven months ago. But on the other hand, it introduces new challenges as well. And I think it increases uh, our responsibilities to make sure that the quality of the online learning that we're delivering is of uh, the best possible quality um, as we move into this new world. Of course, that changing world of work uh, that is being driven by technological development pre-existed uh, the coronavirus. And as we all know, it's having very significant implications for employment all around the world. But in, in many ways, African economies are being uh, the worst affected. And, and we're seeing that around, across the continent in the increasing number of young people who are simply unable to find employment um, because the jobs that they might have expected to go into in the past don't exist anymore. I'm saying that in the context of this webinar because I think that what this introduces is a strong challenge to all institutions that are delivering online learning, not only to be thinking about the methods of delivery, but also what programs are being offered by the institution. It's a very sad reality, in my opinion, that around the world, both in technical and vocational education and in the higher education sector, despite this radical change that is taking place globally, we are seeing that universities and technical and vocational colleges actually haven't changed their curricula very much. And they haven't changed the kinds of programs that they're offering. So I think one of the critical challenges that we face uh, as institutions at this time that the coronavirus is really making more uh, acutely aware, uh, sorry, acutely relevant to us is the need to make sure that the education that we're delivering is relevant to the world, the society and the economy into which our students will be moving. So linked to that, obviously, uh, and I'm aware in Mozambique, as in here in South Africa, this is a growing challenge, that we also need to make sure that the education we're providing is part of a process of ensuring that marginalized students uh, in our societies are being brought into these ICT enriched higher education environments. So in the developed world, particularly, uh, it's much easier for many people to afford the costs of online education. And so we don't have to take account of those. Whereas I think in countries like South Africa and Mozambique, it's actually critical that we make sure that the modes of delivery and the way in which we've constructed our programs is affordable to a much wider range of target students. Obviously, you all know that the great benefit of online learning is that it can reach far larger numbers of people than can be reached through traditional face-to-face -face campuses. But obviously, that doesn't apply if people can't afford access into that education. And this is a very significant challenge, I think, that we face. It's one I think we often neglect in online education because we just assume that online education is going to be cheaper than traditional face-to-face -face education without taking into account the full cost to the student. Uh, and so I think it is really important that we think that through very systematically and we make sure as institutional leaders that the choices we're making about what programs we're offering, how we're offering them and where we're offering them um, are focused on that issue of affordability. Obviously, I recognize that for I said, this is a, a, an important issue anyway, um, because this is key to your economic survival as an institution. But I think it's really important that we, we, we put this right up front 
in strategic planning processes when it comes to thinking about what kind of online learning institution we want to be. So my background uh, is actually in distance education, and that's how I came to meet Wisdom many years ago. Um, so I started my career at an NGO called South African Institute for Distance Education, which is now just called SADI. Uh, and I think it's really important just to start to provide a few quick reminders of what we mean by different terms in this space, because I think, unfortunately, people have started talking about open learning and distance education and online learning as if they're all the same thing. And I think it's important to understand that they aren't actually the same. And we need to be very clear about their differences. So starting here with open learning, which I think is a critical concept for I said to engage with as you think about your strategic direction and your policy and planning. Open learning for me is an approach which combines the principles of learner centeredness, lifelong learning, flexibility of learning provision, the removal of barriers to accessing learning, recognition for credit of prior learning experience, provision of learner support, the construction of learning programs and the expectation that learners can succeed and the maintenance of rigorous quality assurance over the design of learning materials and support systems. In my opinion, open learning can be implemented whether you are a face-to-face -face institution or a distance education institution or an online learning institution. And I think those principles that are articulated in this slide are really critical from a strategic planning perspective at ICED. So every time you're thinking about designing a program and implementing a program, every time you're thinking about what you're doing in your support centers, every time you're thinking about what choices you're making around the technologies you're going to use to support the learners, my opinion is that we should be reflecting on these principles to understand the extent to which our choices are advancing these principles. In other words, if we look at the concept of lifelong learning, are the kinds of programs and courses that we are offering, as I said, only relevant to people at the beginning of their working careers? Or are we also offering short courses and other kinds of flexible programs that might be relevant to people who are much older and either needing to upgrade their skills and competences or else wanting to shift careers or else wanting to pursue a different line of, of uh, development altogether as a human being? When we think about provision of learner support, I think in online learning particularly, this is one of the most critically important factors because it's very easy to deploy online learning programs, but providing effective learner support gets much more complicated in this environment than it is when we have people on a face-to-face -face campus. So these principles are critical regardless of what kind of mode of delivery we're talking about. But then I think that for I said, it's very important that we delve back into the history of distance education. And obviously distance education is a concept that predates online learning by many years. Here in South Africa, as I'm sure many of you know, the oldest distance education institution, I think is now over 100 years old, uh, the University of South Africa, and started as a print-based correspondence university. So distance education has a long history that goes back long before online learning. And I think there are critical lessons that the history of distance education can teach us about online learning uh, that we ought to take into account. That's going to be uh, an essential aspect of what I'm going to talk about this morning, so I, I will not dwell on that now. But just as a summary, distance education is a mode of education provision that overcomes both distances, distances of space and time between educators and learners. Now, obviously, before the development of the internet, overcoming those distances was much harder than it is now. But I think it's very important that we recognize that even when we've moved to online learning, distance is a very important aspect of what we're trying to overcome. Uh, and we need to think very carefully about the choices that we're making, what technologies we're using, how we're delivering the, learner, the, the learning, to take account of the reality that, that what you are doing in the kind of online learning that you are engaged in it, I said, in my opinion, is predominantly about distance education. And what that suggests to me is that we need to think very carefully about how we're designing our programs, learning from the long history of distance education. I see lots of online learning courses and programs 
that are not learning those lessons, not, not in ICED specifically, but around the world. Um, and I think the saddest part for me is the, the number of institutions that are trying to design their online learning programs as if they were face-to-face -face programs and, and using the same basic design principles. And I think that's a total disaster. The use of online learning technologies can work much more effectively if we learn from the history of distance education rather than from the history of face-to-face -face education. And then very lastly, we've got the concept of e-learning and then that sort of blends into online learning as well. Uh, and the reason I'm differentiating this from distance education is because we know that online learning is sometimes being used to support students who are not coming into a campus regularly a distance education type program, which as I understand it is predominantly what we have at ISET. But online learning is also very often being used as a supplementary form of education in blended learning programs for students who are full time on a face to face campus. I think a key mistake that we often make, particularly those academics who come from a history of teaching at a face to face university is we think that all online learning is the same. And so as a consequence, we design our online learning programs in ways that are more like face to face education than they are like distance education. Uh, and, and the key message in these first, uh, sorry, I see the translation has stopped. Let me see why that is the case. I've just tried to restart it. And sorry, sorry about that. Um, I hope that will start again. I hope that will work better now. Um, and so, so the first key message that I'd like to communicate this morning is that as you're thinking about the kinds of policies, the kinds of strategies, the kinds of programs and curricula that you design and implement at ICED, absolutely critical is to draw on this rich history of distance education and to think through carefully how your online learning program designs can draw on that history and the lessons that we've learned about good program design in distance education, not just try to replicate face-to-face -face educational experiences. When we look at what happened when the coronavirus came and many face-to-face -face institutions were forced to shut down, the immediate response was to try to get students to come into extended series of uh, webinars, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Classroom type meetings, Google Meets, etc., and force them to sit in long face-to-face -face sessions online and teach them as if they were face-to-face. -face. Uh, my own children experienced quite a lot of that from their schools. But what we saw very clearly is that when you try and teach face-to-face online, actually it's exhausting for the students. They can't follow properly. Uh, and they're unable to actually engage with the learning in a meaningful way. Whereas the history of distance education has taught us about the benefits of resource-based learning, of designing and developing very high quality educational materials that drive the teaching of the curriculum. And then rather use the communication and the interaction uh, that we can have with students online to support them, to answer questions, to engage with them about problems that they're, they're experiencing, rather than trying to talk the curriculum to them in the way we do in face-to-face -face education. So those institutions that seek to shift to a mode of online learning that was like face-to-face -face education actually ended up causing tremendous stress for their students. And, and again, my own children went through that stress. I, I watched them at first hand. Whereas those teachers who understood that different approaches to teaching make more sense in an online environment and put the time and energy into designing high quality online learning environments were much more supportive for their students. And they actually saved a lot of time and, and effort. So very importantly, just by summary, open learning, even though it's often used as a synonym, is not a synonym for distance education or online learning or e-learning or blended learning. They're not the same thing, but the principles of open learning can be used to help us to design very effective online learning programs. So with that in mind, what I'd like to start with, and just to get 
get you thinking about strategy is just to unpack a little bit the financial logic of distance education and, and the kind of online learning that replicates distance education environments. So if we go back through the hist history of distance education on the African continent, we've seen that it's a very dangerous piece of conventional wisdom that distance education is cheaper than face-to-face -face education. And I think we can make that same mistake in online learning. We just assume that it will be cheaper. But actually, for distance education institutions to be more cost efficient than conventional institutions, it is actually critical that they get the balance between the number of courses that they deliver and the number of students that they enroll correct. Because effective online learning, like effective distance education, requires quite significant investments in designing and developing very high quality learning environments. In our experience, Andrew will be talking about this much more as the course proceeds. It's not really possible for the individual academic to sit down at his or her uh, desk and just design a high quality distance uh, online learning course. To do that effectively, we require teams of experts who bring different kinds of skills, subject matter expertise, instructional design skills, media design skills, et cetera, et cetera, into a team of people who design high quality courses. So if we increase the number of courses that we are offering, that is likely to reduce the level of investment that we can make in the courses that we design. So the biggest mistake historically that distance education institutions on the, on the continent made in their history was to try and deliver very large numbers of courses and then to end up with some courses where the enrollment of students was so small that actually the delivery of that course was too expensive to justify its delivery via distance education. I think the exact same principle applies to online learning. If we want online learning to work successfully and we want it to be financially successful, we must make sure that we target those courses where the demand will be very high. And obviously in the context of Mozambique, that's also going to be closely linked to the needs of the economy and the labor market. Uh, and making sure that the enrollment of students that we have in our individual courses and programs is sufficiently high to cover all of those investment costs that we need to make. And it's when we do that successfully that we get cost effectiveness in what we're doing. But the other key aspect of the equation is that we also need to make sure that the investment that we make in our student support systems, uh, in the case of online learning, that would be our ability to support asynchronous uh, interaction with students online, providing some kind of tutoring support, maybe even having face-to-face -face sessions at your support centers, whatever the case might be. And then also, the support that we provide students through our assessment activities. We need to invest in those much more heavily than is typically required at a face-to-face -face institution. At a face-to-face -face institution, during the normal course of lectures and so on, the lecturers and the academics typically provide that support. In online learning, we need to make very specific provision for it, and we need to recognize that that effective student support comes at a price. So, when, if I go back to when I started my career in around 1992, we did a cost analysis of UNISA and it looked like UNISA was very cheap. But actually when we looked at graduation rates and throughput rates, in other words, the number of students who successfully completed a program, what we discovered is that because the student support systems were so poor and because the teaching and learning materials that had been designed were not, were not very good quality, only between 10 to 14% of students who started a program would successfully complete it after 10 years. So the dropout rates were very high. What that meant is that actually, if you look at the cost of delivering a graduate, UNISA ended up being a very expensive mode of delivery. If we look at other distance education institutions around the continent, Sometimes they are graduating large numbers of students, but if you look at the quality of education that those students are receiving, unfortunately, the same principle applies uh, because the quality of education has been weakened because we haven't invested in it properly. Uh, and therefore, the result is that the graduates come out, but actually they're not really employable. They haven't got good skills. 
So I think from my perspective, as we think about the role of online learning in ISED, it's very important that we make a strong shift away from understanding education as a face-to-face -face educational phenomenon and then trying to use technology to replicate that face-to-face -face environment in our learning management system, in our, in, our, in our materials. And from the beginning, think rather of the design principles of distance education. So moving on from that, uh, as we think about those design principles, I think I just put this slide up because I think it's helpful uh, to differentiate so that we, as you start to do more research, this, this is just an introductory session. We'll be doing a lot of reading and a lot of engagement over the course of the next several weeks. Um, and it's important to remember that a lot of distance education and a lot of online learning is being implemented in the developed world. And very often, uh, the, the, the lessons that we learn from online learning here in, in Africa, uh, we're actually deriving our lessons from experiences that are coming from the global north. And I think it's important to remember that that is a very limited way of thinking about distance education design and online learning design because the imperatives are very different. So in developed countries, the shift to online learning is very often happening because uh, pe people are, are wanting to supplement their learning. Um, they, they want maybe they're pursuing personal interests. It's later in life. Um, they've got finances that they're willing to spend on online learning. Uh, and so this changes all of the different parameters uh, because it means we can design online learning courses where we can assume maturity of students uh, and that they are already capable of engaging in independent study, which is very often not the case in online learning programs uh, in countries like Mozambique and South Africa, because very often the students who are coming into our online learning programs here are still quite young. And, and they haven't developed independent learning skills. Also, very often their schooling has not prepared them well for higher education. So we need to make sure that our program designs take account of the reality that our students may not be well prepared for independent study. In addition, in the developed world, very often people are pursuing online learning to pursue a personal interest. Whereas most often in, in our countries, people are pursuing online learning as an economic activity because they want to graduate and get, uh, sorry, just have to keep stopping and starting the subtitling. Uh, so, so this is for many people, um, the, the online learning experience of the kind that you're offering is their first higher education experience. And it's a critical experience for them to gain access to the economy. So this has very, very significant implications for what kinds of curricula we must design. And as I said at the beginning, what's critically important in that, in that respect is that we have to engage with understanding how the labor market is changing. And I know in higher education, we don't like to talk about the labor market, but the reality is that even for, for highly skilled graduates, many of those who are coming out of the old traditional higher education programs are no longer finding employment because the labor market has changed so radically. So it's not good enough for us just to replicate the courses and programs that we knew. We're gonna to have to think strategically about how to design new programs and new curricula that meet these very specific needs. So critically, in contexts like ours, we need to focus on subjects of national need and subjects where we believe there will be high demand for our programs and courses. We need to understand that student support is especially essential in the early years of study because sometimes our students will be very young. And that student counseling may be something we have to think about incorporating into the way in which our institution is operating. And then, as I've indicated earlier, the cost of the education for the student is going to be much more sensitive than it might be in the developed world. Because for many of the students enrolling in our institutions, they need to become economically productive as quickly as possible, not only to support themselves financially, but very often to support their families as well. So unfortunately though, if we go back through the history of online learning since its uh, developments in the early 1990s, we see a legacy of failed investment. 
and, and unfortunately, I work extensively around the world. I would have to say on balance, I still see much more failure than success. It's really great to be engaging with ISED because it's clear that you've already had early success. So hopefully we can build on that and, and continue to strengthen you as an institution. But these are some of the key lessons that I think we need to take into account as you move forward in, as an institution. The first key failure comes from the imposition of inflexible technological choices that are made without reference to educational need and context. And I think this is an increasingly important issue as technology keeps evolving. So still predominantly, what we tend to do in, uh, in our educational environments is deploy the conventional learning management system like we are using, the, the Moodle. Um, and then we run our programs in a very inflexible method that is very similar to the traditional courses. But actually, if we look at the range of technological choices we have at our disposal at very low cost, it's critical that we design educational systems, ICT systems and infrastructure systems that allow us to keep making flexible choices on a per program basis, not getting us locked into the use of a single technology. That may sound obvious, but it's quite hard to do in practice. It becomes easy to be caught up in just using the same technologies over and over again. So a critical planning decision we need to make is how do we keep the range of technological choices as open as possible so that we can uh, make the correct choices for the programs that we're trying to offer. So the second key mistake that we make is we replicate in our online learning poor pedagogical practices that we had before we used technology. Now, I know this is obviously not going to apply to ISED as an institution, but obviously we all come from prior educational institutions, or many of you do, uh, and so it's critical that we're engaging all the time with the quality of our pedagogical practices and making sure that we're not just replicating what we used to do in our face-to-face -face institution, but we're actually thinking from scratch, what is the best pedagogical way to teach this course? And then using the technology to support that. Linked to this is the lack of investment in integrated curriculum and course design and development processes. And for me, this is the single most important mistake that online learning institutions tend to make, which is that they invest all the money in the ICT systems and the technology and all of that kind of thing, and not, and not nearly enough money in the actual course design. In our experience, the technology is the cheap and easy part of the investment. The expense all lies in the course design and development. If we underinvest in course design, we should expect poor quality online learning in the long run. But on the flip side, if we're getting all of those investments right, we also then run the risk of, over time, accumulating very high operating costs. So I've seen this quite often in online learning institutions where in the beginning, we set up one or two or three systems and we get everything going and it's all working fine. But then over time, we accumulate more and more operating expenses to keep the technology going and eventually it causes a significant problem. So one of the things that I have to uh, really caution there is that every time we're making a technological investment, we should be thinking not only about the short-term expense, but also what its implications will be for the long-term operations of the institution. And then very lastly, the other key reason why there's failure is because of a shortage of people with the skills and expertise needed to staff the programs. So without wanting to um, blow our trumpet, I, I hope that the course will deliver over the course of the next couple of months will be high quality. Um, but from our perspective, it's really exciting to see that ICED is willing to invest in professional development for its staff. Not only our time, but actually much more importantly, by getting you all to participate in these processes. Because we have to keep reskilling ourselves. And as you all know, from your own technological journeys, even just as individuals with your, with your smartphones, technological skills are not something that sits still. We have to keep investing on an ongoing basis in reskilling and redeveloping ourselves. One of the resources I've shared with you on Moodle is called the Horizons Report. It comes out every year. And every year they map the latest technological trends. If you just go back through three or four years of Horizons Reports, 
you'll see how much the educational technology space is shifting every single year. And we have to find ways to keep up to date with that and to keep reskilling ourselves. So this is really important because in my experience in universities, and now I'm talking about face-to-face -face universities, most academics actually don't think that they have to learn anything. So they've almost stopped their own career of lifelong learning, except sometimes in very specialized areas of research. And that's in a way almost the opposite of what we're telling the world. We're telling the world that in the knowledge economy, lifelong learning is essential. You have to keep learning new skills, learning new information. And online learning institutions more than any other are going to have to keep investing in professional development. And you all as individuals will have to keep doing that. So it's really great to see that happening here. So then lastly, um, and, and I think this will then lead us on to uh, the process over the course of uh, the next few weeks is that the, is at the heart of effective online learning is the need for a clear vision. And we, I haven't engaged with this yet in sufficient detail. I would have loved to have come through to ISED and we could then have discussed this in more detail, but we'll engage you on this as we go through this course over the next while is to think about what is your vision for the institution? And how is that vision unique for the kind of online learning institution that you are currently and the kind of online learning institution that you want to be in five years time? Too often, in my experience, universities are just turning over every single year, doing the same thing over and over again, without having any clear vision for the future, without having any clear sense of where they want to be in five years time and how that's different from where they are now. Now, universities have got away with that for a long time. Many of them are struggling with that now because of the various crises caused by the coronavirus. Um, but I think an online learning institution really at its core, we have to have a very strong vision. Why are you delivering online learning programs of the kind that you are offering? And what social impact do you expect that they should have over the next five to 10 years? I know this is not the case with ICED, but any, any online learning institution that is just delivering courses and programs to make money is going to fail in sooner rather than later. But if we have a, a strong vision of the kind of institution that we want I said to be and the kind of social contribution we wanted to make over time, then I think that will be the key to financial success. And very importantly, that vision should then drive the choices that we make about which technologies we use. Are we just using Moodle, our learning management system for delivery? Or are we going to start integrating social media into that? Are we only delivering formal programs and courses? Or are we also going to start sharing some of our intellectual property online freely for others to be able to use? And I think there's a compelling business case for that, which we will talk about uh, in two or three sessions time. Most importantly, though, that vision needs to be located in a very concrete understanding of what the core functions of education actually are and how they need to transform in a rapidly changing world. As I've said earlier, the thing that I find most depressing about higher education around the world at the moment is that the world is changing so fast and it, the educational needs of our particularly young people in developing countries like Mozambique is also changing very fast. But unfortunately, the vision of universities is not changing with it. And I think uh, in ICED, you have a really great opportunity to construct a vision um, that, that, that takes you forward uh, in, in a really more meaningful way. And that in the end will make you significantly more financially sustainable. So my financial sustainability interests are not whether you're sustainable for the next 12 months, but are you going to be sustainable 10 or 15 years from now? That's where the vision becomes essential. And that's where your technological choices will be key. So that leads us then, I'm not going to dwell on this now. I've put some resources into uh, Moodle for you to engage with over the course of the next few days. But what that suggests is that we need as an institution to think very systematically through all of the key focus areas in our institutional policies. We've only received a, uh, uh, one or two aspects of the policies, uh, Wisdom has shared with us your ICT policy and your issues around codes of conduct and, and um, use and so on, which are an important starting point. But 
once we've constructed a very strong vision of what kind of institution we want to be, that has to permeate through every single aspect of our policy. It will have implications for the money we spend on ICT infrastructure. It will have implications for how we invest in program design. Do we construct the right kinds of teams of experts to build our programs? Or are we just expecting individual academics to design their courses in Moodle? If it's the latter, I would argue that your financial sustainability will be com compromised in the long run. And then very importantly, your human resources. Are we making sure that the job descriptions of people are aligned with the needs of an online learning institution? Not just replicating the kind of job description we had in the traditional face-to-face -face university. Are we making sure that people have time in their working day to provide program design? Maybe having some people who focus on program and course design and some people who focus on student support instead of expecting all academics just to do the same job. You know, in a face-to-face -face university, every academic is roughly the same. They all have to do some research, some teaching and learning. They teach their own courses in the main, and they're then also responsible for all their own assessment and student support. In an online learning environment, that's not really, in my opinion, the most effective way of constructing our human resources. We have some people who are much better at program design than others. Let's let them specialize in that area. And then let's have other people who specialize in supporting students online and doing assessments and working with the students in that environment. Not every academic has to have the same job description and job profile. So our human resource policies need to reflect that flexibility, not just assume a cookie cut approach where every academic is treated the same way. We also then need to think maybe differently about our admissions policies and our recognition of prior learning. Are we going to just make that the same as a traditional face-to-face -face university? Or is the online learning model giving us opportunities to, to bring other kinds of students into our systems and get them to the same endpoint, recognizing their prior learning that they may have gained in the workplace, for example, uh, recognizing elements of credits that they may have built up? Or are we just going to replicate what was necessary in a full-time face-to-face uh, educational institution? Again, I would argue very strongly that if we just replicate what we knew from face-to-face -face universities in our policies, we should expect the online learning institution to fail in the long run. We need to take account of the ways in which online learning is very different. Um, so as Chimuzu says in the chat, thank you very much, Chimuzu. People believe that distance education has become a de facto learning strategy but we lack proper understanding to avoid replicating the face-to-face -face mode of delivery. And that's really central to the message that I'm trying to communicate here. And over the course of the next few weeks, we'll take you through what that means in practice. And then very lastly, if we're in an online learning space, by definition, we're investing a lot of time and effort in taking the intellectual property of ICED and converting it into digital resources. Those resources will become available through your technological platforms, through your website, through your uh, learning management system, and through other technologies that you might be using. You have to think very carefully about how that is managed. What are the rights of the individual academics? Do they have intellectual property rights over their own materials, or do those belong to the institution? What are we going to do when we release those for students to use? Do we allow them to copy and share that? using open licensing, which we'll talk about more, or do we try and control the copyright? Can we control the copyright once content is digitized? You know, Andrew is going to share with you a recording of this video. Once we've done it, this, how do we stop you from sharing that video with a thousand of your closest friends? The truth is that we can't. So if we're expecting to make money just from our content and from protecting our content, in a digital world, we might be out of luck. We've seen that in the music industry. Uh, in, the, in the past, it was easy for musicians to protect their copyright. But in the digital age, it's been almost impossible. So they've had to create new business models. To me, what that suggests is that our policies should place less emphasis on just the content that we're delivering to the students and much more emphasis on the overall educational experience we give our students. And for me, the critical differentiators in online learning is not actually going to be the content you supply the students. It's actually going to be how you support your students on their learning journey, 
how you use technologies to provide ongoing student support, and particularly also then how you implement your assessment strategies in ways that don't only measure whether or not the students have achieved the learning outcomes they should have achieved, but also that the assessment is helping them to see how they are progressing on their learning journey. Effective assessment in distance education gives feedback to the students about how they are progressing. It doesn't just measure their progress. In all distance education systems before online learning, I actually studied at UNISA for a couple of years. It was very frustrating because I would submit an assignment and I would only get the feedback three months later through the postal system. By that stage, I've already moved on to the course. I've moved three months into the course and I don't know where I was failing. But in online learning, we can give much faster feedback to students through assessment. So effective assessment is actually critical, in my opinion, to uh, a well-functioning online learning environment. So if we're just delivering content to students in the long run, that value proposition will not be there. And our policy environment in the institution should take account of all of these different elements. So that brings me to the end of the key things that I just wanted to say by way of introducing the course um, and, and, and introducing all sorts of conceptual issues that I think are going to be critical moving forward. Just in, in summary, online learning, in my opinion, effective online learning at an institution like I said, should build on the principles of good distance education design. Think about course design, think about student support, and think about effective student assessment strategies. And those choices should then determine what technologies you decide to use moving forward as an institution. To do that effectively, you need to be able to invest in your programs and courses. And you can only do that if you are very selective about which programs and courses you deliver. If you try and deliver all the courses that everybody might want, you won't be able to invest properly in them. And then you won't be able to deliver a high quality online learning experience. So that may mean fewer courses and programs delivered to larger numbers of students. What that also then means is that your human resources, your academics should not all have the same job description. Increasingly in a good in online learning environment, our, our human resources will start to specialize in areas where they have particular competence and interest rather than all just doing the same job. So that's going to be critical things to think about. And then the policy environment of the institution as a whole should support that type of development of an institution. So I hope that's been a useful introduction to some of the key issues around online learning and particularly has helped you to see how the choices we make as institutional leaders have a very significant impact in the long term on the type of institution we become. So we're um, unfortunately running a bit behind schedule because I've, um, I've moved on to, uh, because we started slightly late uh, and because I've probably taken too long to talk. Um, so what I'm going to do is rather than um, breaking up into groups, I'm going to move on to the next slide and just pose this to you, but also give you an opportunity to ask questions um, and uh, make some comments in response to the presentation that I've just made. Um, so let me open up here to, if people would like to uh, raise their hands and ask questions or make comments. And then if not, just to ask you to think about what your response to these questions might be. Um, what do you think the key priorities are? How do you think COVID-19 has shifted your priorities? And most importantly, what do you think the single biggest opportunity for ICED is over the next two years? But let me open up for questions and comments from people. All right. Um, when it comes to the use of technology for online, in Africa, we have a very serious problem when it comes to technology. Bandwidth, very expensive. Power, inconsistent. And most people don't have the required technology. So how can we therefore effectively use 
the technology available to us in our delivery methods. Um, so, I, sorry, I muted myself there by mistake. Um, so, I think, well, thank, thank you for that, that question. Um, I, I think there are, we're going to explore that, I think, over the course of the, uh, over the course of the next few weeks, because I think it is a very multifaceted question. Uh, and I think it has lots of implications for how we choose to proceed, what technologies we choose to use, and so on. Um, so I, I think first, the first observation I would make is that when we're thinking about our design as an online learning institution, we should recognize that even in contexts like ours, maybe less so in Mozambique than here in South Africa, but I think it applies everywhere. In fact, in some ways more so in Mozambique than here in South Africa. Bandwidth and bandwidth costs are not a static phenomenon. So, so in all countries around the world, the fact is that bandwidth costs have been declining quite significantly over the last 10 years. And they will continue to do that over the next 10. So if we're designing our programs and courses and our strategy based on an assumption of what the technology is like today, I think we're likely to make the wrong choices. I think barring a global catastrophe, it's realistic to expect the cost of, of bandwidth to continue to decline. I don't think the cost of technology devices is going to continue declining. I think that's kind of hit a, a low point and I think it's not going to get any lower. But I think we can expect bandwidth costs to start going down, of course, or, or to continue going down. Of course, that doesn't help students today. So the second answer to your question, I think, is that we need to be very careful about what technological choices we are making so that we minimize the bandwidth effect on our students. Um, so this type of experience that we're having here today, practically speaking, if we had tried to have this kind of connection between South Africa and Mozambique even three years ago, I don't think we could have done it reliably. What we see now is that we are actually able to do it quite reliably which is an illustration of my first point. But if we try to replicate this experience with our, with our students, the reality is that they cannot afford the bandwidth required for this type of experience. So maybe what that implies is that we make sure that in our technological design, we de-emphasize or reduce the extent to which we might use conferencing technology, say, it might also mean that we need to reduce the extent to which we rely on video and very uh, image or graphic rich computer-based multimedia and rather focus on forms of online content that are bandwidth friendly. In other words, that can be downloaded much more quickly uh, and much more effectively, which predominantly is going to require still significantly use of what I would call printed text even if we're delivering it online. So I think that we have a responsibility to think about the technological choices we might be making. But that also then might apply to the way in which we deliver the content. So for example, are we expecting the students always to get online to connect to the learning management system to pursue their studies? Or are we deploying our learning management system in such a way that it can have an offline app that is installed on a person's tablet or computer or smartphone, where when they are connected to the internet, maybe at a student support center or at a local internet cafe, they can actually download a whole lot of resources and then continue to study offline for long periods and only connect every now and again to synchronize what they have done with the institutional learning management system. So I think that there are choices that we can make technologically that make uh, the, the, that make the online learning less expensive in terms of data use. But then the last point that I would make, uh, just in response to your question, is that that raises questions about what kinds of programs and courses we're going to focus on in ICED. Because different programs and, and courses might target different pe people at different levels uh, of economic capacity, uh, you know, ability to afford teaching and learning. And what that may mean 
is that we need to focus on designing uh, programs and courses for people who at least have the disposable income to be able to afford the online learning experiences. Of course, that needs to be uh, put into context because th there may not be that many people who uh, are able to afford different forms of teaching and learning. And of course, we need to remember that if they're, if they're attending a face-to-face -face university, that has its own costs as well. So something that we might factor into that is that in an online learning course, we obviously can be offering that part-time so that maybe students are able to be working while they are studying instead of like in a traditional university have to be full-time engaged in studying. And that may help to make the teaching and learning more affordable and effective. So what that may mean is that we start designing more courses and programs that are targeting people who are in employment and seeking to improve their skills. So, so there's no easy answers to your question, uh, but I think that as we start looking at, at all of these choices, what's our long-term strategy? Where do we see the country going? Maybe as I said, do we have the ability to lobby government about cheaper bandwidth? One of the things that I've seen around the world as a result of coronavirus is a lot of educational websites have become zero rated. So in South Africa, every single university learning management system now is a zero rated website, which means that when students are logging into that website, they don't actually have to pay the data costs of being connected. Can we do something similar in Mozambique? Then secondly, what technological choices are we making? Will they keep the data costs more affordable or will they make it more expensive? We need to be very purposeful about the choices we make. And then thirdly, what kinds of students are we targeting in the programs and courses we decide to implement at the institution? Are we targeting uh, our programs and courses at students who then can maybe work to afford the online learning or alternatively, who already have the resources to be able to study full time? So this is not a, an easy set of answers to your question, but I hope it gives you a sense of the range of kinds of considerations we need to take into account on, on every level of the institution as we make our choices. The reason why I raise um, that question is about the way people think about um, distance education through online learning and focusing on just the current um, technological means, which in most cases may not be seen through that lens. Because for me, or to me, technology is a means and mode of getting something done. And people see that as a media or a medium and a resource to get something done when it comes to distance learning. Because let's say I live in a very remote country where there is no electricity, where there are no computers, I may have a technology to do a distance education. And I may adopt, if I print my course materials and put them on a horseback and then take it to the people in the remote area, that is my technology of getting a done. So, when we look at this, it shouldn't be an all size fit. So I use the bandwidth as just an example so that people should not always think, okay, I don't have a laptop, therefore I cannot enroll. I don't have um, a cell phone. There are so many ways that we would need in, uh, or use in order to get the education to the people. And that's my definition of distance education. Take education to the people. And by whatever means you can, based on what you have available to you and what your students also have in order to receive education. So, uh I, I totally agree with you. you you'll remember that I, I mentioned in an earlier slide that, that I think one of the big reasons for failed uh, investments 
is when people become locked into a particular technological choice instead of being able to make the appropriate technological choices for the educational purpose. Um, and I think that from that perspective, it's also then essential that we keep exploring the new technological developments and what they offer us, not just becoming comfortable that, that we use one particular type of technology only, but that we actually think about how we might be able to use different technologies for different purposes, depending on those needs. Um, and I think that, that we need to be realistic about that. Uh, on the other hand, I think we also need to be clear that for ICED as an online learning institution, online learning is not going to meet every single educational need that every single person in Mozambique has. So we need to be practical and prioritize our choices in those areas where we believe we, as I said, occupy a specific niche and we can take education to the people in the way you describe, but not try and be all things to all people. In my experience uh, around the continent, whether it's Open University of Tanzania or National Open University of Nigeria or other face-to-face -face universities I've worked with, those institutions that try to be all things to all people end up being nothing to anyone. Uh, and so I think that we, we must also be very careful and considered in our strategic choices and say, well, we can't do everything, but these are one, two, three things that we can do really well. Uh, and where online learning will bring education to the people and can do it affordably if we make the correct program design choices. And that I think for me is, it has got to be at the heart. It's, it's got to be almost integrated into the DNA of the institution. Now, unfortunately, and I don't know I said very well, so I'm not commenting on I said. Unfortunately, most universities that I have worked with do not have that kind of strategic planning outlook. They've got well established ways of doing things and they just keep repeating what they've done in the past without any strategic thought. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why many universities around the world are struggling. And I also think it's one of the reasons why universities complain that they don't have enough money anymore, especially in the developed world, because actually they haven't changed. So they're not meeting needs in the way they used to. And as a result, people are spending less money on them. But again, I said, I think as a new institution with a very innovative approach to how it's uh, tackling delivery of teaching and learning has the opportunity to integrate that kind of thought process you just described, Prof, into every choice that it makes. And that should be embedded in your vision. It should be embedded in your policies and your strategies. And we should be always reflecting on the choices that we're making, not just doing it once up front and then assuming that that's gonna last us for the next 15 years. Um, so I think that kind of flexibility and able, ability to shift and then continue educating and developing our, uh, our educational personnel and our staff to be able to not just to survive in that world, but actually to thrive in it, that will be the key to success. And that for me is the real promise of online learning in higher education. Um, so maybe with that in mind, and given that we're getting close uh, to, to the end of the session, um, and bear in mind that this is just the sort of umbrella overview. From this point forward, Andrew is gonna take you into much more practical and concrete uh, technical skills and understanding these concepts, how do we implement them in practice? So this is really just to set the scene. Uh, and I hope that we've done a reasonable job of that. What I'd like to do now is just um, sketch out for you and then ask Andrew to take you very quickly into to the learning management system that he has set up within the ICED uh, LMS. Uh, I have put together a, a few readings um, that I would like you to focus on. All the instructions are in the LMS in the course that we've set up. Um, the, the required reading is not long, so please don't panic. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a few pages of reading. Uh, and then I've got a couple of questions, that, uh, a couple of activities that we'd like you to focus on in preparation for next week's session. But in addition to that, uh, I have added some supplementary readings, which I would strongly encourage all of you to read if you have the time. Uh, unfortunately, everything is in English, um, but that's because of my own limitation in terms of being unable to speak or read Portuguese. Um, but we've got some more detailed documents there uh, that I think will start to give you much greater insight into the requirements of online learning. I haven't tried to tackle that here, 
because those resources can do a much better job of it than I can. So, so that's what will happen over the next week. Um, over to you, Andrew, maybe just to take people through the learning management system quickly, if that's okay. So um, in parting, we have laid out the, uh, the weekly activities for you to uh, access and work on. Um, we're also going to try and make the uh, synchronous sessions, the Zoom sessions, a little bit more hands-on so that you get an opportunity to, to uh, uh, be less passive. Um, some of you were talking nicely in the chat and we would encourage that in future. And um, uh, you can always raise your hand if you would like us to um, uh, um, call on you to address the group. So keep that in mind in future. We want you to be involved and active. So where have we put all your, your resources for this first session? It's on your institutional platform. You are already have an account, uh, Celestino, ensure that you're all enrolled in the right course as well. So as soon as you log in, go to your dashboard and on your dashboard, you'll see it says leadership in online higher education. Click on it and you'll get a, um, a it, it should look like this. So what we've done is there's the program for each week going forward, what we want to achieve and so on. And you'll just click on the week, the appropriate week to access the resources. So for week one, we want you to come into here. And um, we've tried to make it so that you don't need us. It really is supposed to be asynchronous. You can work at your own pace. It should be very explicit about what we want you to do uh, and so on. So uh, in week one, uh, we're just about to complete the asynchronous, oh, sorry, the synchronous session. Um, we are going to put the recording here as well. So if you want to go back and hear some of the things again, what did he say exactly? Then you will be able to pick up the recording here as well. Or if you're just interested in the PowerPoint, you think that's how you like to handle the revision process, then we have the PowerPoint here as well. You can just click on it and download your own copy. But what we want you to do during the next seven days is to tackle uh, part B. And uh, there are three little activities, a number of little readings, and there are two forums which we would like you to engage with and give us your insights into some of the issues. So for example, activity one, uh, we want you as a, a general introduction, what is uh, a process towards what, what would be successful e-learning implementation? What are the best practices? There's a little reading. And then there's a Tony Bates article on 10 fundamentals of teaching online for faculty and for instructors. Uh, we would like you to have a quick look at those. But then very importantly, as Neil mentioned, as managers, you need to start exposing yourself to the horizon, the annual horizon report. So we've put the 2021 there for you. And Neil has identified three things he would like you to consider uh, within the context of ICED. All right. So what do these things mean in terms of Mozambique's context? We heard Martin talking about the specific uh, issues uh, that are confronting learners and obviously faculty. What do those issues mean in your context? And we want you to come into the forum and we want you to uh, uh, click on reply and then give us your insights. Okay. It's one way for us also to see that you're engaged, that you're following <coughs> and that uh, you are understanding. So in terms of facilitation for us, it helps us understand where you're at. All right. And then uh, if we go back, sorry, oh, we've got too many things on the screen here. I'm just going to move that. There we go. I lost my button under a whole load of other things. Uh, and then there's another little activity here on open learning. It was introduced towards the end of the presentation. And um, Neil's given you some um, uh, documents on what are the issues to consider about access and allowing people greater um, flexibility in the way that they learn, etc. And he's uh, given us a open learning policy development uh, document. There's an executive summary if you really don't want to go through the nitty gritty. And then here's your own one here, your um, ICT policy. All right. So in, uh, there are a number of questions again. In what ways can we learn from those documents that could actually implement or, or, or inform 
ISCED policies. And again, there's another little forum. We want you to go in there and give us what you think. Um, Neil and I will be uh, popping in from time to time to see how far the conversation has developed, but it's not really about us. It's now about you guys working as a team and sharing your ideas and responding to each other and saying, oh, you like that idea or whatever. So it's supposed to be a forum where everyone has a say and can engage with each other. All right. So basically, um, you've got till, actually, you've got till next Friday um, in order to complete those little tasks. All right. Are there any questions? Can you stick it in the chat or raise your hand? Because we're going to let go in a minute and leave you alone. Maybe very importantly from, from my perspective is um, maybe just to observe, that, to please request you all to engage with these online activities, N not only because they're essential to the course, but because I think it's really helpful for you to gain this practical experience of what it's like to be a student engaging with this stuff um, and, and to, to look at it from the perspective of the student, but not from the perspective of the teacher. Uh, and I think this kind of participation in these processes helps you to see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and hopefully you'll come back and tell us what we've done wrong about the design of this so far, and then we'll continue to improve it. But I think it's really, it's really important that we actually get the practical feel for how this can, how this looks and how it works. Uh, so, so that we can then pass that knowledge, we can then build that knowledge into the way in which we design courses for our students in future. So please do take the time to engage with this. Also, the webinars are too short to cover all the content that we need to in this course. So we've selected the readings very specifically uh, with that end in mind to, to broaden out the base of knowledge. I, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, uh, um, when yes. it comes to the forum, I think um, it would be okay for me, especially if um, the participants can uh, get engaged through uh, in Portuguese. I mean, I can always get the text translated yeah, so that friends will be very effective. They should not confine their reply um, to only English. So Thank that we have a very good discussion. I can always get the text and translate it. To, so thank you. I, I, that, that's a very good observation. Thank you. And we completely agree. So please do feel free to re respond and engage in Portuguese, not in English, if that is your preference. Um, the Google Translate and other tools are more than effective enough for us to be able to keep touch with that as the incompetent people who can only speak English. So, um, in English, so if you want to know my reply, then you translate it into Portuguese. You can put yeah. it in Portuguese. If I need to get it, I'll translate it into English. Simple as that, so that we can have a very meaningful um, engagement and participation in the forum. Perfect. Good. Yes. Any other questions? Um, uh, as we say, we don't want this to be a passive um, where you, you give up an hour a week and you just sit and listen to someone, yada, yada. We want you to engage, please, because then um, we can see well, that uh, things are happening. Yeah. And, and the good news is now that we've had the introductory session, the next sessions will be much more interactive than this. This is just to set the scene and to give you something to start thinking about. Um, but let's wrap, I think given that we're over the time, um, let's wrap up now. We will see you all again next Friday. And in the meantime, we look forward to seeing you all on the uh, Moodle platform. Andrew will share all of the link details. Thank you very much everyone for uh, participating in this introductory session. And we look forward to continue this interaction over the next several weeks. Thank you very much.